today's change maker is one of my favorite people in the whole wide world. Um, ever since I've went on this autodidactic discovery of history, didn't learn it in the schools, never learned any of this in school, not in high school, not in college. Uh, it was actually in my late thirties that I discovered Ida B. Wells, Ida Bell Wells Barnett. Uh, born in Holly Springs, Mississippi, July 16th, 1862, uh, to, of course, parents who were born in bondage. Uh, her father's story is one that is one rabbit hole. I'm going to drop that breadcrumb right there. That's homework. Go ahead and find out about her daddy because that was an amazing story as well. But how I really um, came to Ida B. Wells is because she was a journalist. And I started my career as a journalist and an educator. And I've been an educator. Uh, she's a civil rights leader as well. She was a civil rights leader, which I wasn't. Actually, she was one of the founders of what they call women's suffrage, even though she didn't get credit and they had the audacity, uh, uh, what's Susan B. Anthony and them, to want her to not march because she was black when the Illinois delegate of this women's suffrage movement, when they were trying to fight for the rights for of women to, to vote. They wanted, they wanted Ida B. Wells to not march because she was black, even though she was the one that helped organize it. So, so there's that, uh, you 53% white women, there you go. Always been at up to, to no good. Even when you were trying to pretend to be up to some good anyway, but her, her activism started, it was May of 1884. And again, she was born in 1862. So she's 22 years old. She was on a train ride from Memphis to Nashville. She had purchased a first class ticket on the train. And as the train was going, the train folk came to her, the crew and ordered her to move to the back of the car where the engine was, where the smoke was, where the black people were. And she refused because she purchased a first class ticket to sit exactly where she was sitting. So before there was a Rosa Parks, before there was a Claudette Coven, uh, Ida B. Wells refused to give up her seat and they forcibly removed her from that train. Uh, and she actually bit the hand of one of the men uh, that was moving her from the train. So again, that's my spirit animal on so many levels. And I won't even call it spirit animal. My spirit, my spirit ancestor uh, that I actually sit in this seat riding on her shoulders. Um, she bit the hand of one of the men and then she sued the railroad. So she didn't just like, all right, y'all, y'all cool. I'm gonna bite you. No, I'm, I'm gonna take it to court. And she actually won. She won a $500 settlement in a circuit court. But of course, you know, because America gone America, America gonna America, uh, that, that decision was overturned by Tennessee Supreme Court. And uh, this is what led Ida B. Wells to the pen. She decided if I can't get justice in the courts, I'm gonna get justice by any means necessary. And my pen is a mighty sword. And she started writing. She started writing about injustices. And a lot is, is said about um, the writing about lynching. And I've talked a lot about that. As a matter of fact, uh, one of the ver very first, the actual very first class that I did with Dr. Greg Carr on a Saturday was about Ida B. Wells because I had questions. I had just uh, read something and um, in Southern Horrors, which is her kind of uh, account of a lot of the lynchings and rapes that happened in this country. And that was her mission was to go around the country. And you think about a black woman traveling through the South, telling on folk, talking about lynchings, talking about the injustices that were happening, using her pen as a mighty sword. She was not safe. As a matter of fact, um, one of the stories she told and what really inspired her, she had some friends uh, in Mississippi who had a grocery store. And, uh, and, and it was called the People's Grocery Store because they served the commu community. They served the people. And they were really popular. They were so popular that white people would go there. They, they had one of the best grocery stores in the area. Well, there was a grocery store just a little bit down the way owned by white people and they weren't getting any business. So again, as is the, the norm, not the exception or the, as is the norm, instead of competing, instead of, you know, maybe lowering your prices or doing a better service, customer service, or delivering something that that black store is not delivering so that you can have business because there's enough to go around. They went to Thomas Moss, Calvin McDowell, and Will Stewart, who were the grocery store owners, and told them to shut down or else. So they were like, nah, we're going to keep going. And one night they came, these, uh, these white guys who owned the store down the street, and they ended up uh, vandalizing and destroying the store, and they killed 
uh, one or two of the owners and oh, a lynch mob came. Yeah. So the, the black people got arrested and then a lynch mob came and lynched her friends. So Ida B. Wells was like, this is too much. And she wrote about it. She had a, she was a black woman that owned a printing press, owned her own newspaper. Uh, that's another inspiration. I haven't gotten to that place yet, but I'm working on it. And, uh, they actually, while she was up North, uh, firebombed her, destroyed her business and threatened to kill her. Uh, and she was going to go back <laughs> anyway, cause that's how fierce she was. And they were like, no, 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 please do not go back. Cause they will kill you. Uh, didn't deter her from continuing to write and use her pen to, to talk about injustices in this country. But I'm inspired by Ida B. Wells for a number of reasons, of course, her journalism. And again, you know, many of us feel like we don't have the power to do something. And this is a woman again, born during the time of bondage, 1862 parents were in bondage, not a lot of money, but somehow was able to scrimp and save up to own her own business, to own her own printing press, to own her own, uh, newspaper. Uh, was not afraid, you know, they, you know, I, I can imagine, you know, folks are being lynched on a regular black women. People don't talk about this enough being abused and raped on a regular. And yet she had enough gumption to not just not get up off that train, but to bite somebody and sue them. You think about that because at the end of the day, you, you only going to leave this earth. Uh, everyone listening to my voice, you're going to leave this earth. How, how are you going to live? Are you going to live on your knees, bowing to pressures of uh, uh, out of fear, or are you going to stand up? You can only die once. So I, I I applaud her because you know every day I open this mic, it is with the knowledge that people were way more fierce and fearless than I am. So I have to tell the truth, and I have to honor the memory of people like Ida B. Wells, Ida Bell Wells, Barnett, who who hyphenated Wells was her maiden name. And Dr. Carr and I talk quite frequently about the uh, women who honored their husbands but didn't erase themselves in the midst of their marriage, raised children. We had our granddaughter on uh, a couple of weeks ago on these airwaves, uh, raised children but did not stop doing the work that they were, you know, uh, imbued to do. And and I think about that too. Sometimes we, we don't follow our spirits because we're afraid of uh, how people will see us. We're afraid of what perception people have or what our place is. Your place is where you're, you know, Clay Kane says you got to go the way your blood boils. That's your place. And if you deny that, you're denying the very essence of your life. Ida B. Wells did not do that. She left this earth far too quickly. Uh, and that was actually the genesis of the, of the conversation I had with Dr. Carr. Uh, that very first in class was Ida B. Wells is a G, but I was asking the question because, you know, you go down these rabbit holes and there's just like one fact. There was a uric acid buildup. That was the thing that killed her. And I think about, you know, as somebody that used to drive a lot, I used to drive to to Florida at least two or three times uh, a year. And I would not like to go to the rest stops. I hated going to the rest stops and I would never go to the bathroom. And I can't imagine traversing across the country telling these stories and not having the opportunity to go to a rest stop because black people weren't allowed to go to gas stations to go to the bathroom or go to restaurants to use the restroom. So if you didn't have a place where you could go, so I'm imagining she was probably holding her water a lot out there in the streets and probably not getting enough water out there in the streets doing that work. And you think about something as... <sighs> not innocuous, but you know, something that's not even simple, but, but something we take for granted is probably the thing that, that shortened her life. But it was the commitment to going out and telling those stories that kept her going probably in spite of, uh, the, the, the pain that she was putting herself in. So that's Ida B. Wells. Uh, I'm, I've given you enough, I think, breadcrumbs to go down. Uh, but those are a few of the things, and there's so much written about her, so much that she has written herself, and yet she is not a household name, and she should be. I keep her over my shoulder. Uh, if you are watching a video uh, of this right now, she's always over my shoulder looking over me because uh, I have to be reminded, not that I have to be, but I'm reminded that I only sit here because of women and men like Ida B. Wells who sacrificed so much. So that's it. 